on the cloud. All right. Welcome everybody. Uh, so I'm going to let my my colleagues allow more people to enter. But this is our fourth fireside chat hosted by the Turing Way. But this time we are delighted to partner with Open Post Academic team who have co-designed the session and will be introducing themselves as a part of today's panel. I'm Malvika Sharan. I'm a co-lead of the Turing Way along with Dr. Kirsty Whitaker. Kirsty, can you please wave? And this is also a good chance for me to share that we have a new community manager, Anne Lee Steele. And please wave at us. Please connect with them uh, if you haven't previously. The Turing Way is an open source, open collaboration and community developed resource on data science. Our goal is to make reproducible, ethical and collaborative data science accessible and comprehensible for everyone. We represent an international community of researchers who create resources as chapters and community practices, building perspectives from their countries and backgrounds. This fireside chat series is an effort towards creating a space where people can gather and exchange concerns, explore challenges, and share different practices that work in different contexts. Please note that we have a shared etherpad to facilitate written note-taking and invite ideas from you who have joined to listen in. We have a code of conduct that applies to this event to ensure accessibility and respectful collaboration. For any concern, reporting of an incident that makes you feel uncomfortable at this call or any further idea to improve accessibility, please email the Turingway at gmail.com. You can also directly reach to me, Kirsty, or Anne by emailing to our private email, and I'll add that in our etherpad. With that, I'm really, really delighted to welcome my friends and colleagues from the Turing Way and Open Post Academics, Ariel Bennett and Beth Duckles, to kick off today's session by introducing the topic and our speakers. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Emergent Roles in Research Infrastructure and Technology Fireside Chat. Um, my name is Errol Bennett. I'm the Program Manager at the Tools, Practices and Systems Programme at the Alan Turing Institute, and I am co-hosting this with Beth Tuckles. Um, I, a very brief introduction from, I'm going to ask everybody to do a very brief introduction um, from our speakers. Um, uh, explain their roles and also what inspired them to take their current role. Um, so to get us started, um, I was actually inspired to take my current role at the Alan Turing Institute um, by attending one of the last in-person Turing Way book dashes back in February 2020. I turned up, I did my first pull request, um, found out more about the team and uh, went for uh, a role as soon as one came up um, on the programme. Um, Beth, can I ask you to introduce yourself, say a bit about what inspired you to take your current role? Great, thank you so much, um, Malvika and, and Ariel. Like, uh, I'm from, uh, my name is Beth Duckles, I'm from um, Open Post Academics, I'm the co-director with also Bo, who's also on the panel. Um, I'm a social scientist uh, by training and um, you know, my current role is I'm a freelance researcher in addition, in, a research consultant in addition to helping out as a co-director of OPA. OPA, um, Open Post Acts, is an organization where we encourage folks with a PhD to share their skills and knowledge more openly, both in and outside of the academy. Um, and, you know, what inspired me to do research consulting is that I found that there was a real need, and I really love to connect the dots between methods and disciplines and to talk with folks both in and out of the academy around research practices, um, both qualitative and quantitative. I'm um, super excited for this discussion. I think there's going to be a lot of conversation here and really great to see folks here on this panel that um, are in the in the audience that I've met before and some new faces as well. So let's pass it along to um, Bo, uh, if you'd introduce yourself. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Bo, or Boran Biliam is my full name, but you can call me Bo. Um, and yeah, I'm also co-director at Open Post Academics together with Beth. Um, and also one of my focus right now is I'm building a community for algorithmic accountability practitioners called Accountability Case Labs. Um, and on the inspiration question, I mean, there's a question that was asked to me or like a suggestion was made by a friend a few years back, which was, hey, when you talk about your research, there's really things that you seem to be like incredibly excited and confident about. And my friend asked me, okay, like now that you're interested in ethics in the tech space, um, you know, like what can you do that helps you bring uh, the confidence and passion you have about your research to this space? And that's really where, you know, like 
accountability case lab started for me. Um, and I'm happy to, to say to say more about this. There's one more thing to flag maybe on today's topic, which is super, super interested, really curious about the way in which the roles and anything having to do with responsible tech and tech ethics are shifting right now. It's a thing that is fascinating um, and that I'm excited to explore and talk about um, you know, today and in other times. Um, yeah, looking forward to this discussion. Great. Uh, Esther, can I bring you in here for an introduction? Hi, everyone. Good to see you all. My name is Esther Plump. I'm a data steward at the Delft University of Technology, where I support researchers with their data management, open science questions, etc. Uh, and what inspired me to uh, apply for my position was actually my origin. Uh, my origins are in bioarchaeology. I did a PhD uh, in that field. And my first article from that project was a methods paper and that type of work allows you to very detailly describe what it is that you've done so that others can actually follow your steps and then afterwards i had to produce more data uh, and had some follow-up papers but then you basically refer to that paper uh, and you sort of pretend that everything is the same because there's no space in the work to describe all the minor details where you you changed things. Um, and so that increasingly got me annoyed about how that we report research uh, together with a couple of other factors. So I decided that I would like to not uh, apply for research positions and um, that I'd rather facilitate others making their research available in a manner that you can actually reproduce it and understand what is going on. So that's why I am still a data steward. <laughs> Amazing. I'm looking forward to coming back to that story, Esther, um, later on in the chat. And finally, Noor, please introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Noor Shakir. Um, I actually have difficulties defining my role at the moment. So I'm the SVB and general manager of the company in, in the US called XCAM, uh, which acquired my companies. I was a CEO and founder of a company called Glamour AI, which was acquired just a few months back. Uh, my background is in science, um, so I still define myself as a scientist. I did uh, my background is in computer science engineering, so did that and then got hooked in, into AI and artificial intelligence. So decided to, to pursue a career in that kind of space, uh, and that led me to. I'm originally Syrian, so that meant that I had to, to leave Syria. I moved to Belgium, did a master there, and then from there I joined one of the greatest lab in, in Europe doing computer games, uh, AI and computer games. So that was a lot of fun, did my PhD in computer games, and then was lucky enough to kind of um, get appointed as an assistant professorship by the end of the day, doing AI machine learning on, on different topics. So I spent about almost 10 years in academia doing in different types of AI uh, in, in different disciplines, and then decided when I got my like six, six months almost into my assistant professorship, decided that probably it's too early for me to kind of settle in an academic position. Um, and I felt like I still have enough energy to kind of do something completely new. So decided to drop my assistant professorship, moved from Copenhagen to London um, and jumped into an area that I don't understand at all, which is building startups. So build a start. And then that was about like six, six years ago now almost. Um, and then since then, I've been focusing on applications of AI in the drug discovery space. So the, the company that I mentioned earlier is my second company. And we're basically interested in um, finding ways to teach machine design better, uh, better medicines, better drugs. And I think the kind of the reason I am in that space is because, first of all, I'm, I'm super excited about the potential of AI and the, the way it can augment human abilities and it can really empower empower us a human. We, we are great in doing so many things, but AI has kind of orthogonal aspect to it. So we can really elevate our, our abilities by, by AI. And that's really great. And I'm also super excited about medicines and drug discovery and healthcare in general. Um, and happy to talk a little bit more about this as well. Great, thank you so much for the introductions for everybody. Um, really, uh, I, I'm so interested to hear more from each uh, member of the panel. I wanted to start with a question around what are the big challenges you see right now in these emergent roles 
and research infrastructure and technology, what are the what are the kind of big picture sort of challenges that you see? And I'm I'm just gonna say that I've heard already brief bits of this in the introduction so far as you know, nor you mentioned, you know, I have a difficulty defining my role. Like what is this role even to start with? Um, so Anyway, you want to take this um, and let's uh, start, uh, Nora, if we could start with you, uh, if you feel up for jumping into that question. Well, the, the reason I mentioned difficulty defining Maro is because I've been founder, CEO, and now general manager in this VB, and it's it's been kind of like just wearing too many hats at the same time. So like at, at one point, like for, for an hour, you're, you're coding something, another hour, you're talking to clients, another, you're talking to an investor, and now like talking to kind of people, educating them about like what I do. Um, so it's, it's, it's just a lot of different things. And then kind of the other aspects, like being a mother and um, kind of a wife and having a life, which doesn't happen so often. But still, um, so it, it it is a lot of things. And I think that's kind of what I really love about my job is like being able to tap into different areas and blurring those kind of different disciplines and different skills together to kind of define who I am. Great. Um, can we go to Esther? What are some of the challenges? Um, also, uh, defining the role and what it is that you're supposed to be doing is, is a, a major challenge, not just um, from the outside world, so to say. So the researchers that I support sometimes also don't know the type of questions they can contact me about, um, because open science is very broad. So what can a data steward actually do? And then the data steward is that for open science, etc. So it's, it's very complicated in that sense. And for me personally, it's also challenging that my um, role is listed as a support position. Well, like Nora, I also still identify as a scientist and I also still do some what I would call research. And that is not always acknowledged um, or I cannot fully contribute sometimes, uh, for example, if there's a funding applications with certain criteria and uh, that you need to be paid to do research in order to be the main applicant, I would not qualify for that, despite probably being able to lead the project better than uh, other researchers on that specific application. And also, uh, if you want to join certain organizations or boards, if they have certain criteria, uh, which this new role does not fulfill or which this role slightly falls away from because it's difficult to define these type of roles then you're you're sort of stuck in the middle and sometimes that is a bit challenging thank you for that how about your thoughts bo yeah so i there's like two branches on the challenges that are top of mind for me just right now um so the first one is i'm an ethicist and it's on the side of what's going on with ethics and in the ai space in particular um and so yeah so like you think so we're thinking about ethics one way to th think about what ethics is is it's ambitious comprehensive consideration of rights harms and values emphasis on ambitious and comprehensive and when you think about the ai space the first question is okay where does that fall <laughs> where does that that fall in the life cycle of such a technical system but also like where does that fall in teams and there is a really wonderful little paper um, that I put a reference to called Owning Ethics by folks at Data and Society that, you know, like it's been like something that I keep referring back to and thinking about like, you know, like how can this go wrong, right? And how can trying to insert, you know, ethics in the AI space go wrong? And one of the really interesting things that the paper um, puts its finger on is what happens when you don't truly carve a place for ethics within your, you know, like your like product life cycle, within the life cycle of your, you know, like engineering develop, develop, development and practices, but also, um, you know, like your other like corporate governance practices. And like, you know, like, like the kind of situation that the paper describes quite well is what happens when really you put ethics in a position that is, um, you know, caught between what's happening with engineering, what's happening with product, and what's happening with other aspects of corporate governance. And you don't truly carve a place uh, for uh, these considerations to gain traction in the way that you function and operate. And the counter to that is current fantastic work done by tons and tons and tons of people, including folks in the private sector, including folks in, you know, in academia and folks in between, uh, finding ways to truly embed ethics in the way that you build data sets, in the way that you do engineering, in the way that you think about products, in the way that you think about uh, what, good, what does good performance mean? <laughs> 
Um, and so like, that's the first like, you know, like, like, like thing that I flag on, on challenges that I notice. Um, and like, I see people take really good steps on. The, the other side of this is, you know, like related to accountability more specifically. Um, and it's the perception of accountability as uh, something like narcs is a frame that uh, some, a friend of mine has used. So, so like folks who talk about accountability, they're, they're a little bit like, like, like narcs or the police, they're after us, they're looking for like, you know, like, you know, like the mistakes and missteps we made. Um, and really that the accountability concerns are in a position that's adversarial vis-a-vis -vis other actors in this space. And big question is, okay, how do you change that? <laughs> um, yeah, so this would be like, you know, my short, like two different um, traps um, that I've noticed. Yeah, really helpful. Ariel, what are your thoughts on this? What's some of the issues you see? Oh yeah, so um, I have, a, I have a, a couple of issues that I see kind of, um, I think probably one of the biggest ones is uh, actually recognizing the sheer variety of roles as these start mm -hmm. to emerge out of perhaps generalist uh, postdoctoral or sort of uh, senior fellow positions where people are having to do a bit of everything um, on top of producing high quality original research at a, you know, a rate of knots as well. You know, they're also lab managers and engagement managers and they manage yeah, public and private partnerships and all of this stuff. And so as these roles kind of emerge and become more specialized, um, it's recognizing that um, supporting people who want to take on greater responsibility in those areas, providing them with a, a framework in which to grow and develop. Um, I think the industry, I think, is much more flexible in this regard, Nora, and I'd be interested to, to hear your thoughts on whether um, it's a bit easier to kind of craft a role for yourself in industry or academia. Um, but I think uh, on the flip side, academia can be still quite rigid. People very, very much focused on their idea of what a researcher is um, and what, ty what types of roles you have in, in academia. And there's not really a progression pathway for a lot of people. Um, and so instead, what we're seeing is uh, the growth of um, kind of external organizations, I'm thinking of particularly in the UK, we have the, the research uh, software engineer group, the S Software Sustainability Institute to support research software engineers. Um, we have the Centre for Scientific Engagement um, and Collaboration um, that supports scientific community managers, for example. Um, you know, and so it's kind of been outsourced to these other these other organisations because it's very hard for the institutions themselves to kind of deal with and recognize all these emerging pathways. So I think that's probably the biggest challenge I see at the moment. I love all this. I'll, I'll comment with some, some, some sort of understanding here. So again, I'm a sociologist, so I tend to look at like, what are the structural challenges that are going on here? And I've noticed a couple of structural issues, right? So institutions don't know how to do things across disciplines or across groupings, maybe don't know that their role needs to exist, but there isn't enough movement as Esther was talking about. Um, and then I also think, from my, from my end, there's a lot of call. We have very complex problems these days. You know, AI and machine learning are incredibly complex. You know, climate change issues are far reaching and complex and we can't find answers in small silos. We're going to have to cross disciplines and we're gonna to have to make, um, have discussions occur between disciplines. So Bo and I both have done some work on cross-disciplinary conversations and some of the, the social mechanisms that are necessary to have conversations where we can stop walk ourselves back a little bit and say, I'm using this word risk, for instance, is it the same word that you're using when you speak of risk? You know, how do we define our terms, but then also how do we talk with one another when our norms and our and our understanding, uh, our understandings of things are quite different. I'll also just speak to, um, you know, there's sort of a sense here that folks have said, we have, we can see these roles being necessary and needed. And yet I also think sometimes it's hard to say, hey, I'm here, I'm here, <laughs> you can use me, I've got these, this information. And so there's a bit of a storytelling question too, because we're used to what a PI is and doing a, a, a job, but we're not necessarily used to that person that helps make things run or, I mean, and community managers, I think from CSCCE is one place where we're seeing more of that kind of articulation of that role, but there may be more roles like that, which are crossing the boundaries and crossing the disciplines in the fields in order to have these discussions that are more far reaching and where we can call on things. So I'm thinking also with what Bo is speaking in terms of ethics and connecting that to, you know, um, machine learning and AI. Um, so those are my thoughts around the, the challenges. Um, yeah, Ariel. 
Yeah, I yeah, I just to come back on that, Beth. Um, the one of the uh, really brand new roles that we're seeing emerge at the moment is the concept of a product a product manager being applied into academia and academic research in the form of some new roles at the Turing called research application managers. And they're really thinking about, you know, how do you ensure that people can reuse the outputs of their work? How do you make sure that it is being um, produced in an open source way so that you're really producing the corpus, uh, really producing a body of work that can be built upon? Um, but they're taking a lot of inspiration from product managers in um, that kind of translational <laughs> role in now. academia, in um, industry even. Um, but I, so, yeah, I just plus one to what you said. Um, Noor, you talked a little bit about this when you um, gave us your introduction, um, but thinking about your own career and, and kind of your, your switch between academia and industry and um, over a few different fields as well, how much of your career to date has actually been kind of planned out in advance? Um, and if you did any kind of planning, um, how did you approach that? You know, what was kind of your guiding principles when you were thinking about what next steps to take? <laughs> That's a very good question. I think I always had a plan, but I never followed on in, in a sense that it never worked out really. Like future is always kind of a mysterious thing and it, it just happened and you have to make your best bet, I think, when, when things come by and just be confident and have like just your gut really. So I like initially when I started I wanted to, to to be an an academic and that's why I kind of went on to to become a, like to, to take my PhD but the plan was to finish and go back to Syria for instance and start my own private university and provide better education for for kind of the, the new graduate by the time I finished my PhD the war started back in Syria and, and I couldn't go back so <laughs> the plans changed but then I got lucky to get funding from the Danish government to do my my own research and that meant that I stayed in academia for a bit longer than I than I planned and um, and to kind of start thinking about really kind of becoming a system professor and just staying in academia. By the time I started kind of heading toward my assistant professorship, um, my mother kind of was diagnosed with, with lung cancer and that changed everything. So I start thinking about um, like legacy and like what am I contributing and what am I doing with my research versus what, I, what else I can do and how else I, I can contribute. So decided to leave academia and do a startup and I haven't had <laughs> a clue about how to start a startup. So decided to kind of just make a bet and um, join a startup accelerator and learn about, about how to do things. So I think like, and that's kind of continued really. It's like, it's, that's the story of my life. But I think that kind of my, my takeaway is like, always have a plan. You need to kind of project is like, at least where you're heading, like where, where your North Star is. And by, by following like vaguely that plan, you end up in a better position all the time. But like without having a plan, you you I wouldn't have done a PhD, for instance. You, you always have kind of to look at what where where the world is heading. I knew like AI is gonna be a big thing. And that led me to a very good position by, by kind of just vaguely following that plan and then not be surprised what, by what the world is throwing at me, pretty much kind of just take it, figure it out and just just move on, build, build on that. Yeah, I, I love that point. Having a plan so that you know when you're going off plan is a, is a really, really interesting point. Um, and so, I mean, can we just dig in a bit more about um, the point at which you made the switch from industry, from academia into industry? Um, and how did you find that kind of transition at that point um, and get it, jumping straight into a startup accelerator as well? Yeah, um, so I think, it's, it's very important for someone to know the weakness, right? I, I knew I was a very good researcher and I knew I was a very bad CEO because I didn't know what a CEO meant back, back then. So the, the best way for me to do it was kind of to, to do a course on, on what that means and how, how to go about it. And the course meant that I, I joined a startup accelerator where they basically educate you. So Entrepreneur First is a startup accelerator here in London. And the kind of their main remit is that they take people out of academia and they basically put them, put them as kind of a pool of like-minded people who are all interested in building startups. And then within that kind of program, it's, it's about three months. I don't know if they changed back then. 
from back then. But it's, it's basically kind of a very extensive number of like courses and talking to people who's done it before and so on and so forth. And that really give you like within a three month period, a very wide range of um, like exposure to very wide range of topics and experiences and knowledge about how to kind of really transform from being an academic to, to kind of taking it, taking a role in a startup and what that means and how to build a startup and, and, and all of that. It was very interesting for me because when, when I became assistant professor, it, it just became more of kind of like doing the same. So there wasn't really a lot of learning happening anymore. And that wasn't really expected. And I think that's why kind of also another reason why I felt like it, it was pretty much kind of that that was the end of like a path for me it, it it didn't feel like i'm i'm learning anything i'm kind of improving i'm growing but when i when i kind of joined the startup world it was a very very steep learning curve and i i loved every bit of it and i i like until today i feel like i always keep trying to kind of just put myself in that position again so i like, can like being being in a startup kind of gave me that curve and then doing, for instance, going from AI and computer games to AI in, in medicine, that, that was kind of an, another curve where I had to learn about drug discovery and chemistry and biology and all of that. And I, I always try to kind of find those challenges and put myself in those positions because I feel like this is the only way that we can grow and we can expand and hopefully we can be more, more of value to the society. Yeah, I love that point about deliberately putting yourself in a growth position where you're you're going to learn new things regardless of, of whatever else is going on. Um, Esther, can I bring you in here for a, a, a chat about your career planning, particularly around, you know, kind of transitions and big decision points for you? Yeah, so my career planning, since I was 16 years old, I wanted to be an archaeologist. So I severely failed at this. The last time that I had a shuffle in my hands and uh, was on an excavation was, I think, in 2013. Uh, so that plan didn't go through. Um, I held on to that quite long because I did my PhD in archaeology. But during my PhD, I saw some things in research that I did not necessarily like. Um, I kind of imagined a researcher to be like an eternal postdoc where you could just do your own research and just you could continue doing that until the end of time. Um, but then slowly realized that no, actually the point is to grow into being a professor, etc. And I saw my professor not really being in the lab doing his own research anymore. There was no time for that. Instead, you focus your time on um, basically writing proposals for funding that have like a 10% uh, percentage of people that actually get the funding. And I was looking at that going like, well, I don't really like the odds of 10%. So I'm going to shift that. I'm going to find something else. And then I realized, well, I'm, I'm in this very specialized position and archaeology is also not the greatest markets for jobs. So I need to find something else that I do like. I need to build up skills. And from there, I tried to um a, yeah find a way to develop these skills by for example participating in the people's council so that i could uh, represent phds and make sure that no one else took as long for uh, on doing their phd as long as i did um, but also figuring out whether this was something that i'd like maybe policy development etc and it was actually pretty fun and a lot more collaborative than my research project in any case so i i really started to enjoy that and from there i basically just looked at vacancies uh, and then at some point you have similar vacancies that stick to you um, and in my case it was actually quite difficult because uh, data stewards is like a role that didn't exist since 2016 or not in at least not in this uh, sense so there was not really a pathway to go into that and there were a lot of senior roles who expected sort of like four years experience when the role is only like two years old and it was quite difficult to build experience into that so from there i basically just joined every event on open science data management etc that we had in the netherlands and i just learned from there talked to people and it's really amazing what you can learn from just talking to people, how their job looks like, what type of people are in these type of positions. Uh, so I can really recommend that if you have no idea where you're going uh, to just delve in into these type of events, especially now since a lot are still online, it's quite easy to join uh, and really delve into it. And so from there, uh, I 
I think attending events really had a, a big impact on me landing my current position. And so, and there we are. I'm going to jump in as well with, with some of this because, you know, we run uh, open post academics. So I've heard a lot of folks who've left academia or are considering leaving academia. My own story is about leaving the academy um, for personal reasons, essentially, and, and trying to find other things. And so I think I look to things like what Nora was saying around, you know, the challenges that you have in your personal life, geography not being the right location for you. And I think a lot of times for academics, we assume that we're just going to get that tenure track job or that postdoc and we're just going to move to that place where we don't know anybody and it's all going to be fine and you know those of us who are in OPA are like yeah that doesn't always work right our parents get sick things happen we've got kids that we need to take care of like our partners get jobs somewhere else and we have to figure out new directions and I want to normalize that because I think the perception that you're a good researcher because you've gone down this path I mean I did go down that path and it wasn't right for me as a tenure track professor um, so I stepped off of it myself and became a research consultant. And honestly, I don't think I did have a plan, but part of the reason I didn't have a plan is what Esther is talking about, which is that some of these jobs don't really exist. So we're sort of looking to support things and, and to do the work that we're trying to do in, in places where maybe the, the name isn't quite there yet. Um, as an, an organizational sociologist, I can tell you those jobs emerge. And especially as we start to see more connection between different kinds of disciplines and fields, um, those jobs emerge, but you know, what's funny Esther is saying, like, you know, we need, we need somebody who has four years of experience for a job that we've had around for two years. Like, wh wh what do we mean by that, right? So, so how do we start to tell the story of like, yeah, actually I am a, a data steward and I have been, but it just looked different because I was doing it in this other setting. And so I find a lot of that translation work for folks who are post acts in particular is how do I talk about the things that I did before and move them into the new fields that either are being are emerging or that we might want to see or, or, or that I might want to create or a job that I think needs to be done. Um, because I'll just be really honest, this is what I say all the time, there's a lot of problems in the world out there and we've got very smart people coming out of academic fields and I really want those smart people to go help with some of the problems we have in this world. Um, so, so pick a problem, start going and talking to people about that problem and see what you can do to offer something um, to help. And I realize that that doesn't address the problem of money, but I just, I'm just passionate about trying to say to folks who have excessive degrees that you have skills and please go use those skills to help the world. Um, I'm also um, realizing we're kind of, um, want to move to the next question, I think. So I'm going to, um, so when we brought this conversation together, what we were really trying to do is get a sense for, we had a sense that these research infrastructure and technology roles are emerging, expanding. Um, and so I wanted to just turn to the panel and say, could you talk about why you think these roles are emerging now? Um, what are the drivers for the roles coming out? And then what kind of needs do you think that these roles are filling? And if you disagree, please let me know. Um, if you don't think these roles are emerging, would love to hear that too. Um, and whoever on the panel wants to go first, if you feel inclined, jump on in. Or I can call on people, it doesn't matter. Go for it, Bob. Yeah. So there's an old, and I'm going to paraphrase it very poorly, um, you know, there's an old lines that I quite like in a book that I've spent way too much time working on. Um, and again, this is a paraphrase that goes something like, something like, we need ethics when our institutions are broken. <laughs> um, and, you know, and that's also when ethical problems become truly disorienting. Um, that's the thing I find, you know, like really fascinating. Um, but, um, you know, the part of this that's about our institutions being broken and the way in which that puts pressure on us to struggle with these disorienting questions is the part that's like, you know, uh, that's on my mind right now about like, like why are the roles shifting, right? Um, so if we can look back at the 70s, you know, uh, the phase where uh, thinking about the US specifically, uh, we built infrastructure to guarantee that pharmaceutical research was done in a way that wasn't harmful to human subjects. Likewise, for academic research on human su subjects, we've built infrastructure, we've built governance uh, systems to make sure that uh, these activities aren't harmful. We've done that kind of inf you know, capacity building around um, how to prevent harms, how to avoid harms, uh, you know, in the past, it's a thing we've done in a lot of different sectors. Um, and part of what I notice, and like, you know, like why there's so much haze around like the new roles that are, you know, that, that are emerging around uh, AI harms is on the one hand, AI is disrupting so many different sectors in a similar kind of way that statistics has over the years. So like, you know, like as, you know, 
just like you can ask yourself, like, you know, like, is there one area of our lives where statistics doesn't play a role, right? And um, to my mind, like, that's a good proxy for the kind of magnitude and the range of areas in which we can see AI being deployed. And um, any area where you can have statistics, you can probably have AI tools and um, machine learning tools. Um, and so like, yeah, there's that first component of just the range of uh, sectors in which really like, like new tools, new practices that we understand somewhat, but don't understand all that well. And that have also opacity that's sometimes built into how they're, how they're designed for like deep learning algorithms, for instance. Um, and so, yeah, so we have on the one hand, just like, you know, like emergent technologies that are like changing what is being done where, and we have on the other hand, uh, a lack of infrastructure, a lack of capacity in navigating, anticipating and being proactive about the harms that may come with those disruptions. So like, you know, that is gonna, that is gonna cause friction on what's happening on the people side and the roles. That'll be my short you know, soapbox. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, so, so this, this like, emergence of of the need for this and it's making me think of you know multiple fields that as statistics got into them right so the field wasn't in statistics originally but then it kind of gets moved into it so we've got examples of this change happening and so we're going to be seeing it again um esther nor ariel anyone want to jump in for yeah, yeah I, I actually yeah, it's quite uh, i have a few few thoughts on this um in terms of uh emerging roles and i think it's is part of um, a growing sense of recognition that um, you know research actually better research is done when you have clear frameworks and it's, it, this is building a bit on what Bo said about you know building those governance structures and things. Um, I think well, particularly from the perspective of say U UK research, people are, are recognizing that research needs needs better frameworks you know you you need to have people who can guide you through considering ethics because we recognize that having a, an under a deep understanding and appreciation of the potential harms and benefits of your research means that you do better research mm -hmm. having good project management governance for example and like looking at it from my role means that you know you have um, a clear idea of where your research might be going the potential outputs you have um, you know you make sure that you've got um, funding coming up in the pipeline and, and people are well supported and um, you're actually using the resources that you have available to you as much as possible um, in a time when it can be quite competitive to get funding um, and I think uh, particularly from sort of the community managers aspect which is um, sort of a very big growth area I think is the recognition that um, the recognition that um, you know research is not done by a single person working at a lab bench in a you know a tall tower it's done by distributed teams across the globe it's done by um people who have coffee together every day it's done you know through slack and on github and uh, in conference halls and and things like that and it's predominantly done by people working together um but it's also the the sort of the collaborative skills and things like that they're not something that we automatically teach people when we are training them to be researchers and so um, you, it is helpful to have somebody who is thinking about how to set up a collaboration so it's successful how to maintain that sense of community how to help connect people um, so that they're having the right conversations at the right times with the right people and you've got a good mix of skills in there and that everyone has a shared sense of purpose um, you know, it, it is more complicated than it used to be. And, and I think that's because ultimately the, the standard is going in the right direction and, and research is getting better. So mm -hmm. that's me. <laughs> that's my, my little soapbox there. Yeah. And, and I'll just, um, I, I see you, Bo, we'll go there in just a second, but the, the, there's a, so I've worked with Openscapes and they, they teach, we can teach these skills, right? We can teach these skills of collaboration. We can work on what it means to have leadership that includes people and what inclusivity looks like. We have the, the ways to do that, but it's often seen as like just something you pick up along the way and you'll magically be able to do without having any training. And I, I just, I find that like, like, we used to joke in sociology, it was like the white paint, like everybody wants white paint when you're painting a painting, right? It's a little hard to paint something without white paint. You know, you need to have the, the, the social skills and the glue and the pieces that pull, pull folks together. Um, and the perception that that's not something that has to be taught or trained or talked about even is what makes it so that you have toxic and difficult environments. And um, so how, how do we encourage that kind of stuff and, and encourage those conversations? And I see the open community really working towards that. 
Bo, please jump in. Yeah, two things. Uh, the first one is, yeah, I saw here, like, cross disciplinary is really, 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 really hard. <laughs> it's front of mind for us at OPA. I linked, you know, a little toolkit we built on this, uh, you know. But the, the main thing I wanted to say is follow up on what Ariel was saying, which is um, when folks think about scientific communication, I see a lot of, like, like instinct that is going towards, oh, how do we take science and make it understandable for the very, very broad public? But what I'm noticing in looking at spaces where you need really like effective cross disciplinary collaboration, where you need really good integration between subject matter expertise and, uh, you know, like the different kinds of techniques that are being used, um, but also with, you know, like, like product and corporate governance, um, is there's a side of, there's a real communication challenge to making expertise understandable and digestible for other experts. And there's also gold in the skill sets to do that translation between experts. If you find different communities that you're already interacting with, they're, they're very, very likely are, you know, like, like, like spaces in which those communities need support and help in better understanding how to really take into account the expertise that will make a difference to the challenges they're facing. Um, you know, and that's, you know, that's another side of what Ariel was, uh, you know, like, like, like describing that, that that's really like top of mind for me. I'll just piggyback on that briefly is that I think there's also a lack of understanding maybe of what, what folks might have expertise in. So in other words, that there are, you know, I've, I've gone into with corporate clients that I've worked with, and we essentially have to say, hey, there are experts in this area that you're trying to do this work in. Let's bring some of them in so that you can talk to them and ask them the questions that might help you develop products or services that would be more beneficial. And those kinds of conversations end up being really enlightening both directions, right? So the expert may only talk to other experts and may not know how to convey this information. So we have to figure out how to ask questions in such a way that they can share that. But then also the folks who are, are, you know, in engineering mind, you know, like, I'm just going to fix this problem, I'm just going to do this thing, maybe haven't thought about, oh, there's entire theories or, you know, bodies of research or literature on specific topics um, or fields. And, and so I think like those kinds of connections, you know, the expert to expert, but different kinds of expertise is, is a maybe a skill set in science communication that could be could be broadened. And what does that look like to speak to another expert? You have to be willing to understand their their field as much as you um, can to be able to make that communication happen. Just going to open it up. Esther or Nora, does anyone have more to add on this question of um, expanding technology roles? Um, in research and infrastructure, Nora? I think just kind of one point to add is that what, what I noticed like moving from academia into the industry is that like we, we, like within industry, we focus a lot on like multidisciplinary, bringing multidisciplinary people together and like kind of putting them in an, in an environment where they have to talk to each other. Otherwise mm -hmm. they, they're just out, right? I mean, if you can perform in a multidisciplinary environment, you, you, you simply don't belong, you're not productive. And we have like now also kind of those like special type of people we call, it, like call them like a glue people who kind of grew to kind of learn the two languages and then work between teams to kind of facilitate both team working with each other and back to your point about understanding the language. So if, so if we're saying like risk, what that, what that means, or like if we're saying accuracy, what that means like in, in, in chemistry versus in machine learning and, and so on and so forth. I felt like in, in academia, that wasn't really necessarily the case. You can you can still be in, in your lab talking to the people who are kind of in, in your comfort zone. You don't have to go anywhere. And you can still be a very, very successful, like you build a very successful career path, but that doesn't mean that you can benefit, like grow personally and as, as a kind of community and as, as, a, as a group as, as, as you would have done if, if you kind of just moved into the lab nearby and, and talk to them. And there is like, well, like back in my days that there were there wasn't like any incentives for for any researchers to do any kind of like that kind of multidisciplinary um kind of growth or like there, there weren't really any reward for it so why should why should anyone do it and i think one of the the kind of the, the theme that you you guys talked about like finding people like placing people who are kind of broad like to can look at like the, the future of the research that you're doing i think that's very important a lot of researchers got like stuck in in their own kind of uh, research and they can't really see beyond that and the feeling is that like you finish your PhD 
and you can either find a postdoc within that kind of area or like you're kind of stressed really you don't know wh wh where to go but if you are like from the get-go thinking about like the possibilities of what you for, for to building so you have like a postdoc as an option but you also have a kind of a way to build maybe a startup out of your research or like join join another group and kind of expand in, in another area where it can be applied i think that's very very important for like for the kind of academic com com community to focus on helpful Esther, did you want to jump in? Yeah, just to tag on to all the multidisciplinary uh, work uh, and indeed the increasing flow of information makes these type of roles really emerging now because you can't communicate your science, write the papers, review the papers, host conferences, um, make sure that your entire project is running well, make sure that the lab is running, share the data, be a research software engineer, like you only have 40 hours for 40 working hours in a week. Um, so it's quite difficult to be good at all these tasks. And I do think it is good that some of these things are more specialized or that we have these emergent roles. Um, uh, in place now, I think one of the issues that I see is that some of this work is valued more than other uh, types of roles or work. So if we value the publication or the summary outcome of the research more than, for example, a community manager who ensures that no one has had a burnout during uh, the whole project and make sure that the project is connected to other projects, etc., which really contributes to the quality of the eventual publication, for example. But then how do we recognize that person if we keep the focus on just these research articles and which very much focus on superstars in academia, which is indeed not the case as you're always part of a community, whether that's your project, your institute or your wider research community. Um, yeah, that's an issue. I think I would just like to add that. Yeah, just to uh, jump in on, on that, Esther, I, I agree with that. I think one of the one of the reasons that we're seeing kind of an expansion and a growing recognition of these roles now is it's part of a bigger sense, particularly in academia, certainly within the UK. And I have to acknowledge that I'm very UK centric in my perspective. Unfortunately, I've only ever worked there. Um, that uh, this big push for like recognizing alternative outputs and values of of research and the work that is performed around in and around um, research and academia as well. So we have, you know, the main UK funder is running a, a big campaign to cover all of the different um, roles that also contribute into producing research outputs. Um, we had the hidden ref that happened this year that was um, focused on highlighting people who or roles or outputs that are, you know, traditionally underrepresented in our um, slightly moribund bureaucracy um, of uh, our um, evaluation framework at a national level and, and that kind of thing. So there's a sense of like this broader shift. I'm also thinking of things like the San Francisco, San Francisco Declaration of Research Assessment, which, you know, um, asks institutions to look beyond which journals people are publishing in and look at, you know, their, are they making their code open? Are people using their code? Are they collaborating? And all of these other aspects of research and work that um, these types of roles, these, you know, non-traditional, non-stereotypical roles um, that are emerging and are developing, evolving, um, are, you know, really pivotal to actually making sure happen um, and, and are successful. So I think, yeah, there's also this sense of a, a, a broader conversation um, around that as well. Um, hi, so, oh, I think, so we were, we were kind of, um, then go, we were going to spend a bit of time talking about the differences in the, the sector, but Nora, it, sort of between academia and industry, but Nora, I think actually one of your previous answers really hit the nail on the head in terms of acad industry really being very focused on bringing multidisciplinary teams together. I, I mean, certainly from my time in, in industry, it's all, it is a more flexible space. You know, they're more willing to say, we have a business need that needs to be addressed in a specialized role. We'll just go ahead and create one. Um, and, you know, finding the funding for that and, and things like that. But I don't know if anybody else has any sort of perspectives on um, kind of the burgeoning sense of these 
um, roles in other areas that are not academia, but maybe the, the third sector and nonprofits, for example, and whether there's anything that we can learn from um, those sectors and the way that they approach kind of filling their needs uh, in terms of um, job descriptions and people that work for them um, as we bring it back to, to academia. I can jump in with a little discussion around the third sector. So I've done some consulting and working with, um, you know, um, uh, social sector groups. Um, it's it's still, I mean, some of the same problems exist and there's um, a lack of, I think, language around how to talk about it. Um, uh, specifically assessment and um, evaluation is the way it typically gets talked about, but there's variation in the different kind of subsectors within the, within the social sector. Um, and, you know, there's, I've also worked in government as well, so um, some of the needs in government are um, very specific and very interested in cross-disciplinary work, um, but it can get a little focused on just the specific area that you're in. So, for instance, I was in the energy sector for a while, um, and the energy sector is a real focus on other folks who know about those, that specific topic. So, some of the kind of cross-groups where you wouldn't necessarily think to invite somebody from who's an, got an archeology span background or who has a history, history background. Um, and yet those folks can often offer a lot into the discussions that might not otherwise be, um, be approached. So I think there's still a lot of room for em embracing and bringing in other, other um, discussions. I think, again, a lot of the work that ends up happening for the person who's applying for those jobs by articulating how they know enough about that sector to be able to um, add something to it. Uh, so it can be challenging for folks who are leaving academic positions, trying to figure out where could I fit in. I really think the, you know, um, nonprofit sector might be a good fit for me. I really like the meaning and the and the belonging, but you haven't spent much time there. So what can you do to be able to kind of engage in those discussions? And um, I think speaking the language is really one of the key pieces, figuring out what are the things that folks are most concerned about in the particular sector that you're interested in um, and, and learning that kind of thing. Um, but I think it's really important and really valuable when you can find those those connections between um, industry or between the third sector and between um, academia. And we certainly do have a lot of folks um, as I, in OPA, we have like a job board where we share some of the jobs that come out. And it's interesting because originally, you know, in the beginning, a lot of the things were, oh, we're, we're looking for PhDs. But as we've gotten going, there's been more and more where it's not necessarily looking for a PhD to fill the role, but we can see, we can start to see the connections of how somebody with a PhD or with a background in academia might be able to contribute to these places. And that's, that's I think, really the, the growth is trying to figure out how to, how to, how to find the, the places. Bo, did you want to jump in? Yeah, there's there's a piece of that puzzle that's on my mind, which is um, the whole like challenge of like how do you discover and learn about alignments between real needs and expertise, and um, and there's a piece coming. I mean, you know, and this is like you know like very crude like you know <laughs> version of this, but there's a piece that like is loosely inspired by product product thinking that I find helpful here, which is just. Um, instead of trying in the armchair, which is a habit that at least personally as a researcher I used to have, I would just like sit around and look at what the perceived holes from my perspective are in the current research and, and kind of do this armchair exercise of thinking my way to where I think the need is for my expertise. Um, and there's a piece here yeah, from like product thinking that I find personally very helpful, which is what can you build that and then put in the hands of real people <laughs> that can help you learn and create helpful feedback loops between the things you can potentially offer and uh, you know, where your expertise is really needed and also help you discover where are the needs. Uh, and yeah, it's a thing that I've been, you know, it, it's a thing that I found like, like really eye-opening uh, to start to implement that kind of thinking and, and how I go about learning about where the needs are, <laughs> where the needs are for different buckets of expertise, yeah. Where, what can you build and also who can you talk to? I feel like yes. it goes both ways, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like not just, yep. and sometimes what you can build is something like a short paper or a short discussion or a short like qu question even. I, I've seen tw Twitter tweets been have been like, what about this? Has anyone talked about this thing? And and there can be short little bits. It doesn't have to be something mat you know huge, but you know who wants to have this discussion? Who wants to talk about these topics? You know, are there other people who who are interested in this? And then you see. And if you get crickets, then the answer is nobody else is thinking about that, or you just said it at the wrong time, 
Or if you do something, you can start to spark a conversation. And I mean, I think for accountability case labs, I'm really seeing you spark some of those conversations in a certain way. So how do we bring people together to have discussions around a topic? And we co-create it instead of just thinking I have to do it all myself, which I think is another piece that academics can kind of learn from design thinking and design you know, research. Um, how can we create this together instead of thinking I have to run the entire thing on my own? It's not a lone wolf kind of thing. I love the comments I'm seeing in chat, by the way. Keep this going. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a great conversation happening. I'm actually, I'm going to pull in um, Andre's question that came up um, a while back while we were discussing something else. Um, that he says in the chat that um, the roles are emerging only possible when they avoid embarrassing the definition of what a researcher is. One can propose and make it happen as long as researchers are not disturbed in the way they carry out their work. Collaborative research only will happen when this definition is opened up. What does the panel think? So this is a bit of a spicy question. Um, I think my take on this is that um, I think we are increasingly seeing um, folks become more flexible in their definition of what a researcher is. Um, particularly as we see, you know, people in industry making like massive contributions um, in terms of driving uh, research forward. And then, you know, people with these multidisciplinary, multi, I want to say multi hyphenated roles as well, also contributing. And so the idea of um, sort of academia, it's still there, it's still very strong, but I think it is beginning to change and beginning to become more flexible as we all recognize that people you know, aren't, they're not handcuffed to a, a lab bench um, in order to be a scientist, you know. Um, so I'm interested to hear what people on the panel think. And I don't know if anybody else has been mulling over this question um, from um, from when Andre posted in the chat. I can probably talk about it like being in academia and the industry. I think the difference like that we make in the industry, at least when we hire somebody, like when we say like machine learning researcher versus like a machine learning engineer, for instance, the main difference is that researchers are usually driven by their own curiosity. So you, you kind of, you dive into a field without having a clear objective of how that translates into a commercial traction or like into a product or into something that, that has a benefit, right? So you're doing research or you're doing your study just for the sake of um, understanding, uh, really understanding the, the kind of the phenomenal, understanding some aspect of it. And that's for me really what, what defines a researcher, like a curious mind. You, you have to have a curious mind. When you move into the industry, you focus more on like, yes, I want to do something interesting, but at the same time, I need to make sure that that something is going to make me money because otherwise I can't keep the company alive. I can't, I can't, I can't keep it afloat. And that's, that's for me is the main difference. Thanks, Noah. And Beth, do you want to jump in here? Yeah, I'll. So when I was, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a sociologist and I studied sustainable green building practices. So I worked with a lot of uh, scientists and talked to them about their work. Um, and I was applying for a lot of different types of jobs. And one of the things that my advisor said when I was looking for all these jobs in the tenure, you know, multidisciplinary jobs. And my advisor said, just be who you are. Um, draw from the experiences you have and be that person. And I've always found that really helpful. I don't ever try to be anything other than what I've been, but I also want to be honest about the expertise that I do have and the experiences that I've had. So it's a sort of a, a, a combo of, of um, you know, I, I speak from the, the research that I've done. I speak as a researcher in my field, but I wouldn't pre presume having hung out with a lot of people who do building materials research that I know, but building materials research. I have read some of it, but that doesn't mean that I can comment on it in anything other than as a sociologist and from the background that I have. And so I think it can be helpful to sort of, um, it's not even a limiting, but it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a, an assurance that it's okay to just be who you are, <laughs> to come from the background that you've got. And you know, when you start to have experiences where you have done collaborative work or where you have done things that are, you know, or where you're doing what Nora is describing in the, the research where you're focusing in, in a different way instead of just your curiosity, but also maybe what are our goals as a, as a team, you know, thinking through how do I articulate this more? And then if you don't have that experience to show genuine interest or curiosity in doing it in a different way, I think can be a real way to either get work or to be engaged in, in, in communities like that. So um, yeah, hopefully that's useful. 
Great, thanks Beth. Um, I, Esther, you've unmuted, and then I, I see Bo also unmuted, so we'll come to you after Esther. Yeah, I had a bit of a crisis about this question a year ago when I applied for funding, uh, for which I thought I was eligible because the criteria were, were to have a doctorate or a PhD, to have a position for the, uh, the amount of time that you're applying for at an institute, uh, and at the institute that I was working at was also eligible. So I basically fitted the criteria and I was like, well, great, we can do this. Uh, we can apply for this. And then when I applied as main applicants, they actually got back to me like, hey, it looks like you're applying as main applicant, but you're not suitable uh, because you're in a support role position. And uh, so can you put an, maybe another researcher from in the application as main applicants, which is quite questionable. Um, but I don't want to linger on um, to that for too long. But mainly, they tried to tell me that I was not a researcher, uh, but they didn't necessarily want to say, you're not a researcher. And at the same time, I got very confronted with my own biases because I wanted to demonstrate, like, I'm eligible because I have a doctorate. I'm a researcher. And the first thing that came to mind was, like, I still publish papers. And then I went, like, oh, no, I'm defining research as publishing papers. And, and yeah, so I had a bit of a crisis there. And in the end, I decided, well, I can still say, like, I'm organizing conferences. I'm also sharing my data. I'm um, presenting. Oh, and by the way, I, I also still publish, etc. So why am I not eligible? So we had a bit of a back and, and forth about me not being a researcher or sort of kind of. And that was quite difficult in the sense that for me, it's also difficult to define what a researcher then is. But I think I'm going to agree with Noor uh, that's about being curious and it's about contributing to the knowledge base that you have in your discipline. And I still do that. And therefore, I still identify as a researcher. Esther, thank you so much for sharing that story. Marvi has said in the chat that it breaks her heart. And yeah, it, it also breaks mine. And I would also like to, to meet the people who came up with those regulations and, and give them a bit of a shake. And because I think that it that is um, a very real barrier that a lot of people face who want to do, you know, independent research. I know um, there I've had research software engineers as well who've run into this problem, you know, they want to do independent research, they want to lead research, they have, you know, the, the capability, the background, a permanent position at a research institution, and yet the answer is no, computer says no. And so I think there is definitely, definitely areas where the bureaucracy needs to catch up with the reality of how the landscape is shifting for definite. Yeah, and to let people lead, actually, because you could argue that I can contribute to the project and I can still run it in the background and someone else can lead it in, in name. But that's not the same as actually leading something and actually getting the credit for it and me being promoted in the end uh, in my own job for having leadership skills and positions, etc. And it's... Yeah, indeed, a lot of people have the same issues where you can't really demonstrate their skills if you keep being put in the background because of some formal criteria or some boxes that you don't 100% fit in. Yeah. This is yeah. an institutional yeah. problem. I mean, <laughs> this is, I just want to just highlight this is this is and I think so, so often we can see these things as like me, I'm the one who didn't. And I just want to like highlight it is not you, it is a system that is not doing what it is designed to do, which is to encourage people who are capable of creating more knowledge to do so. And I mean, I, I will say with all the challenges in industry, in industry, if that if there wouldn't be those barriers, that those barriers or there's different barriers, but it would be like the barriers are, oh, we need to get rid of those barriers because they're stopping us from trying to create this knowledge that we need to create. Um, so I just, I, we created these institutions, we can uncreate these institutions. I'm sorry, but like, it's not, it's not okay. Yeah. Um, Bo, do you want to jump in here? No, yeah, no, so, yeah, Beth kind of, I mean, this is what I want to say. Yeah, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but I just want to add to what, what you're saying. Uh, so, you know, when we notice that boxes and definitions are actually hurtful, actually get in our way, or actually inhibiting as opposed to being empowering and enabling, there's a temptation to think of it as, Oh, like we can just redo it. There's a temptation to, to think because because that's how definitions are, you know, that's how we, we interact with them, right? Like the definition is okay, like like this means such and such. 
uh, well, we can change it. I can think of alternatives. It's very easy to think of alternatives. Um, and to me, part of acknowledging that what we're dealing with when boxes, roles, definitions become really constraining, really inhibiting, really get in the way of what needs to happen, um, is to acknowledge that um, the task isn't just to think of alternatives. The task is also to find what are the junctures at which small changes can be made to enable those alternatives? It's not just what are the alternative possibilities, but it's what are the pathways to those possibilities? And like, you know, like very specifically, there's often also a, a habit component uh, when we're dealing with like, like roles that are too rigid and acknowledging that um, there's a place for uh, building um, spaces and experiences to which people can forge new habits around things that matter to them and around things that have a lot of pull, like thinking of the role of researcher as academics, it's not possible not to uh, attribute a lot of power to that role. Um, yeah. yeah thank, thanks, Bo. I'm actually, I'm going to bring in um, another question that we've had in the, the etherpad from Cass um, that uh, notes that the UK, a lot of um, we'll call them newer universities, actually have separate career tracks for research and teaching faculty, both culminate in a professor level. Um, she asked, do we need a, another split for research facilitation, for example, community managers, data stewards, etc. How can these roles be separated from administrative or professional services roles, for example, human resources and finances, for the purposes of defining the gap we exist and work in? Um, and I'm actually, I'm if anybody's got any thoughts on this, definitely do jump in. But I'd also be really interested from Noor's perspective on this, having sort of made the decision that, um, you know, acad like academia assistant professorship wasn't going to lead to the, um, the growth and the exploration that you wanted. Do you think that there is a, a case for kind of making that structural change to academia and perhaps, you know, bringing back that growth to sort of more senior positions? I think I felt it was too difficult to change academia <laughs> to the point that I decided to leave. <laughs> it, it, and it, I think it is still still true. I see like my, a lot of my friends are still in academia and I follow their, their career path and I still hear the same struggles that I have been like struggling with like since then. And I think it's it's a big part of it is because it's it's modeled. Like once you are in in a, like in, in an advanced an academic position, you're expected to do everything except for research. And the reason you stay in academia is because you want to be a researcher. You want to you want to like innovate. You want to kind of work on the cutting edge. You want to discover something new. And what the university and and the kind of the academic institutes expectations of you is like that. that back to um, Esther's point, you have to apply for funding and you have to to secure those funding. Otherwise, you're out. Or you have to do numbers of, of hours of teaching and sometimes for subjects that are not even closely related to what you're doing just because there's a gap in the program and some, somebody has to fill it. So it, it was just kind of a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of expectations beyond what, what like an outsider would expect really from like, what, I mean, if, if I ask like anyone maybe like from outside academia, what are you expecting an assistant professor to be doing? They would expect, expect them to do, to do cutting edge research. But that's not really the case. And I know a lot of people just kind of supervising and um, grant writing and doing kind of administration stuff that that has nothing really to do with their their expertise and with like with, with their passions. And that's why we kind of find a lot of really successful people just kind of even like either spin out so, so leave or like just leave and, and start something outside. It just felt for me too hard to change the system from within. So <laughs> perhaps like going out and then starting from kind of a plank piece of paper <laughs> is easier, but I might like <laughs> be taking a very pessimistic view. Thanks, Noor. Uh, does anyone else on the panel want to jump in on this question? I so personally, I would love to see um, some more pathways that recognize the fact that you can have a lot of very specialized, very technical knowledge. You can be contributing, again, as we mentioned, contributing to the knowledge base um, in your field, uh, but still not, you know, be kind of fitting into the neat boxes that we tend to put um, academia into at the moment. So I would, I would love that. But I'm going to hand over to Beth now for the, for the next question. Sure. 
I'll just jump in with that last little bit. I think I think in my career so far, what I've done is look for the interesting people and look for the interesting conversations. Um, because I find that those are the folks that I want to work with that I'm interested in the, the things that they're doing that are, and I think of it as kind of coming at a slight tangent to what, what's going on so that so that we get multiple perspectives. And that's always been kind of the thing I, I focus on. And if you're a non-traditional type of person, so if you've done multiple things that maybe don't seem to go together, yet they do for you, I feel like those are the folks that I tend to be interested in what their perspectives are. Um, and that might just be me. Uh, so I'd love to um, kind of give us a, some chance to um, think about like what we would do if we had um, a bunch of funders, if you were just, if somebody was about to give you a bunch of money or a leader who could kind of make things happen, um, what, uh, what advice would you give them for the roles, um, for the future of non-academic research roles? Like what would you like to dream of as, as we're going forward? What, what do you think would be, you know, five, 10 years out, what, what could we see um, in these roles? And um, we can start wherever, if there's anyone that wants to jump in or I can call on folks. Where might we see directions? Go for it, Esther. Yeah, I wish that people would really focus more on the end results or, or improving quality of research and, and really trying to contribute to the major challenges that we have uh, instead of focusing on these formal requirements that we have and therefore some people don't fit to these requirements or this is not this does not seem like the best solution right now etc it's a bit difficult um yeah i i wish we could really focus on these challenges and and how people could best contribute to that rather than uh in indeed the uses of boxes so i hope there's no more boxes actually in 10 years from now for me, I think it's like I, I would like to see kind of groups just get like melded together. So like different groups from different disciplines and under one roof. So like not like the computer science department and the biology department and the chemistry department and no one took to each other to each other. I think we have to kind of rebuild the infrastructure so that people sit around the same table and they kind of exchange idea um, around the different discipline they work they work in. I think that's kind of we've seen like a lot of innovations happens like right now just by people accidentally talking to each other or bumping each into each other and i think we need to kind of implement that within the system so it, we don't have to rely on <laughs> luck or like serendipity to kind of for, for those things to happen Bo, do you have thoughts yeah this point about relying on luck is is really like top of mind for me like maybe like one wish list would be I would love to see much, much better resources, but also much, much more common knowledge about um, how different areas of expertise end up in roles that are surprising, uh, given the, the expert we're going in. So like, there's a lot of shared knowledge around those like pathways that are uh, where there's a critical mass. Like, you know, for instance, a, a lot of, um, you know, qualitative researchers end up finding, you know, a place for them in, in UX. I mean, that's the thing I hear quite a lot. Uh, a lot of people with like formal computer science built, you know, ba backgrounds find, you know, like roles as computer, computer scientists and engineers, uh, you know, um, in software development. Uh, so there are these like pathways where there's like a high critical mass, but I would love to see you know, more like common knowledge, more, more, um, yeah, and uh, yeah, just like better common knowledge about the surprising matches. How does the surprising matchmaking work? What makes it work well? How do you do it better? How do you build capacity to do the more surprising matchmaking between academics and non-academic roles? Absolutely. And I'll pick, piggyback on that to say, I think there's another piece, which is the cachet that comes from some of these like uh, community organization building kind of skills, that it's not just management, but that it's also a research function as well, that the, the kind of connectivity and cross-disciplinary kind of conversations. And if I were to give five to 10 years from now, what I would love to see is that actually have like a name, a story, a desire. We put it in our grants. We want those people. Like we, we know that community building and connection building is important and we, we, we value it monetarily in addition to mon monetary and also, I mean, cachet wise, right? So the, the sort of the, the status wise that we say data stewards are in, like valuable and, and important to our work as a, as a central goal instead of like, oh, they're an add-on, they're something that we just kind of do. Oh, those people are really 
you know, we're, we're adding them in and we're making them kind of central to what we do. So I really agree. With, I think everyone's got some great advice here for funders and, um, you know, maybe we can send them a copy of this uh, recording afterwards. Um, but just to, to finalize, I think what I'd like to see in sort of five years, five, 10 years time is a complete rethink of a lot of the career advice that um, folks entering even at undergrad are, are given about what is available to them and how to shape their careers going forward. So at the moment, it's, you know, it's very well defined. People have very, people who they tend to get their career advice from also have very limited perspectives. When I was an undergraduate, the options were get a PhD, go into secondary school teaching or um, go into management consultancy. And I was like, I hate all of those ideas, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Like, I, you know, I was like, none of these appeal to me, but those those were the three main options that were pushed. And instead, we should be um, talking to people about how they identify the areas and the skills that they have, the areas and the skills they want to develop, the expertise, fostering a sense of real curiosity, not just about, um, you know, like understanding a very specific scientific area, like in detail, but also curiosity about um, the broader world as well. And you know, and themselves, being curious about themselves, what makes them tick? Like, the reason that I'm in my role now is because I love making things happen. I really enjoy getting to know a research area, but I love embracing lots of different things and being on the operation side of, of, of the work that goes on and feeling like I contribute to something bigger. Um, but that took me, you know, several roles and, you know, enjoying bits and pieces of it to find that out. Um, and so I think particularly for the folks who think that they might want an academic career, given all of the funding pressures and, and things like that, we should be advising them to think about their careers in terms of exploration and figuring out what works for them, their skills and, and how they want to develop as a person. Um, and so, yeah, that's uh, that would be my advice to funders and, and folks. Great. Uh, do, do you have a direction for us to go in next, Ariel? Well, um, so we've that those were kind of our, our, our closing pitches to the to the funders. Um, but we're now going to dive into the um, soft, uh, the, I'm, I'm thinking of the softwareconservancy.org, the um, uh, shared notes document, and we're going to pull out some questions from there as well. Um, if anybody has a question that they would really like to ask, kind of live. If you want to raise your hand, um, then we're, I think we're happy to take questions from there. Um, but otherwise, I we have a question in here for the panel from Lou, who I'm not sure if uh, they're still on the call. But I'm curious about the challenges of being a generalist in terms of never being a deep expert in any one of the many skills you have. Um, for example, using project management or product management methodologies, but not as a full-time role, one of multiple skills. Does this lead to self-doubt or imposter syndrome? So I don't know if anybody on the panel has got so thoughts on wearing many hats and imposter syndrome. I can speak for myself. I don't think it's the case. I think like working, like having not like depth in one area, but like, going like horizontally and like covering a lot of different areas in not as much depth is, is a skill in itself. A lot of people can't, can't do it. Um, they got like switch their brain from one area to another and talk to a lot of people. So that's in, in itself is, is a kind of, is a strong skill. And there are a lot of roles who hire specifically for people from that kind of kind of people. And that really kind of, from my experience, there is not, not really a lot of people who have that skill. A lot of people are really afraid of jumping into different areas. A lot of like people are afraid from uh, going beyond their, their comfort zone. So it's, I, I mean, it, it, is a, it, is a, it is a skill, it's a career path in itself. It's kind of, um, it's an area. It's like, it's, it is something that I'm trying to say. Yeah, I, I feel that no, one of the things I've really enjoyed about my career today is all of the different fields I've been able to explore and get to know on a relatively superficial level, but just enjoying the variety nonetheless. Uh, Esther, Bo, Beth, any thoughts on, on wearing multiple hats and imposter syndrome? Yes, yeah, so I also have to help out 
multiple types of researchers with varying research topics and in the beginning you think like oh i need to know what it is that they're doing and uh, no you do not need to know everything that they're doing because they are doing it you just need to know sufficiently enough so that you can communicate well with them and so for me that involves moving from just doing data support to also software support so i had to pick up a little bit of programming to be able to uh, really just talk in the same language because that's if you don't know anything about programming, it's very difficult to advise people. But at the same time, I do not need to know how to run um, a Python library software package and completely support the community, etc. So the, 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 that's the nice thing about specializing. People very much understand that I don't know all of these details, but I know enough to communicate with them. I love that point, Esther and Nora, and, 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 and I would just add to it also that the ability to be curious is your is your superpower in this like the curiosity that you bring to the discussion allows that other person to articulate articulate it more effectively and gets you off the hook for having to know something i think as academics we often think we have to know the answer before it's said and i don't think actually when you're working in these you know places where you are being a generalist your value add may just be that i ask really good questions that i that i'm curious enough to try and find out what you're talking about um, I think that is a huge value add. Bo? Yeah, imposter syndrome feels like real to me as well. <laughs> and, and, you know, one of the things that's really helped me personally is to pay attention and try to listen to I mean, what, what does my imposter syndrome listen to? What is it going to hear? Like, you know, when I start feeling this kind of doubt, like what makes a difference? What makes the doubts go away? For me, it turns out that like clarity on like my sense of purpose with what I'm doing, bringing some joy to what I'm doing, and also, uh, you know, just having collaborators <laughs> that, that I find inspiring turn out to be like, like pretty consistent, uh, you know, remedies. But like, yeah, like just be curious about like, what does your, you know, what do your doubts listen to? What do they respond to? What makes them a little more quiet? You know, and that's gonna be different for different people. Yeah, that, that's great, though. I really love that, that kind of like listening and then finding it like really interrogating your doubts and where they're coming from as well. I think that's um, really great. Uh, we have a few more questions in the chat. Um, uh, we have some really uh, ones that we maybe want to tackle super quickly because we've, we've actually only got four minutes left of this hour and a half chat. If you were you're still here and still listening. Thank you so much for sticking with us to the end and hearing all of these incredible uh, contributions. Um, but I'm going to uh, start with people talk about uh, le the leaky pipeline, but don't talk about how slow this leaking is. Um, do you, does the panel have a, a kind of thoughts around the need for um, such a transition? Um, and the fact that uh, a leaky pipeline is framed as a negative thing, but actually is probably quite positive as people find places that they are more suited to and roles that they are, roles that they enjoy as opposed to um, sticking in the traditional academic pipeline. I think that's what Andrea was getting at. Um, and Andrea, if you're still here and I've, I've butchered that, then please do um, unmute and clarify. I'm going to just jump in with with this. So I think one of the things that we do that's a disservice to folks who have left academia, either because they have left along the course of their PhD or afterwards, is that we say to them that they've somehow failed in the work that they're doing. And I see incredible amounts of really great research that's done that's actionable, that's useful, that's beneficial. Some of my most cited work has been outside of the academy. Um, really actual shifts in how people do the things that they're doing. Um, so the perception that um, there's some sort of failure there to me is really one of the failures of the academy, not the failures of the people who've left the academy. Um, so I, I try to um, raise up and to talk uh, with, at the very least, um, neutrality, but also <laughs> with maybe even pride, pride at people who've gone on and done other things. And I talk about them in the same way I might talk about somebody who just got an editorship at a top journal or something like that. Um, you know, thinking of these things as not lesser than, but as simply another path, to my mind, is really a revolutionary act in this space. Yeah, 
I agree. Anyone want to quickly jump in on that? Otherwise, I'll move on to the next question. Um, okay, great. Uh, I, I think this one's from Jim and it's directed to you, Beth, as well. Um, is there some kind of uh, signaling pattern between people that allows experts to recognize somebody who knows enough to bother trying to work with? And I think I would, I would modify that to say, how do you identify people who are open to collaboration and, and willing to, to learn more about what you're doing? Yeah, I think you have to talk to them. I don't think there's any way around it. And you need to see if it's a conversation or if it's a one way. I, I think we've all experienced the thing where it's a one way discussion where it's one person speaking and the other person just hangs out. So, you know, is this a conversation? Can we have a conversation? If I ask questions, are they engaged with? Um, that, that to me is the signal of whether or not somebody is going to be worth having a discussion with. Um, and I think they exist in, in, in and out of the academy, but um, you know, sometimes you have to just have a quick 30 minute chat with someone to see if they're the kind of person that can, can have that interaction with you or not. No. Thanks, Beth. And does it, do any of the other panelists have any final, final thoughts on this? How do you, how do you find people who are, who are open to collaboration and, and connection? Invite people to collaborate. <laughs> But I especially love the part about like have the conversations too. Like I feel like it's a lot of, but honestly, invite them. You may be surprised. At least it's been a surprise for me. Awesome. Um, Esther, no anything on how you go and find uh, find your people? Mm, I think social media is a great place. <laughs> you can again, like that's kind of some form of invitation, really. So you can post on LinkedIn. You can post. I actually got some collaborators from tw Twitter. So now, now everyone is like everywhere and you can find people in surprise, surprising places. Esther, any final? I, I was a bit distracted by uh, typing into the chat. So if I say something strange, it's that. Um, but I tend to work together with people um, who have done interesting things or which I have just genuinely like in the sense that um, they're great people and I would like to learn from them and that's how I choose uh, to whom to say no right now and I'm in a very privileged position to do that especially in research because I'm not dependent on any relationships um, I don't need to please anyone in my discipline I can basically freely say no or yes to whoever I want and that's a, a very nice type of freedom and a privilege Amazing. Thank you, Esther. And I, I love that the freedom to n not be beholden to networks is, um, is yeah, it's really something. Um, I'm going to sort of add my own contribution to this and say that if you're looking for people to collaborate with, you could do worse than starting with uh, folks who are involved in the Turing way. We love uh, speaking to people, finding more um, collaborators, people who want to add something to uh, one of our five guides. Um, I'm going to plug my own chapter here, which is the research infrastructure roles chapter. This is the chapter we, we launched it at the last book dash. Um, it is a work in progress. Uh, we would love to have folks who are still researchers but don't have the title researcher come along and tell us about the work that they do, either submitting a case study or talking about um, their role um, more generally is sort of like a profession that's developing as well. Um, it's still open for collaboration and we'd love to expand it. Um, and I think we are now at time. We're actually two minutes over. So uh, I think I'm just going to close by saying, no, Beth, Bo, Esther, thank you so much for all your contributions, for your thoughts, for sharing your stories, um, both good and bad, your wiggly career paths. Um, and uh, a great overview of kind of the structure of academia and industry and how it's changing and how we figure it all out. Um, and thank you very much everyone who's joined us and, and stayed for the whole, um, whole hour and a half, um, given us such great questions and enlightening discussion in the chat as well. Thank you very much. Um, we run these on a regular basis. So if you have an idea for another one of these, then please do get in touch with Mavi or Anne. Beth, do you wanna? Yeah, I just want to say big cat thank you to Malvika, Anne, and Chrissy, and Ariel for all that you did to put this together. Really grateful to get to collaborate with you, and thank you for all of this hard work. Um, thank you so much to everybody also who is paying attention, and the amazing things in the chat. I um, really love the discussion. Let's keep the conversation going on social media and everywhere else. Thank you.
great.